The modern action RPG often suffers from a big problem. What is the point of these? What do they do? How is the core combat? Pretty good, and even great in areas. Uh-oh. Cooldown timers about this finale. I wasn't really into it all that much. The modern action RPG often suffers from a big problem. Once upon a time when RPGs had turn-based combat, things worked great because there was no whiplash between core mechanics. Combat was menus, managing your character and preparing for battle was menus. You clicked on your inventory, you clicked on enemies. Even some old PC real-time action RPG games could be argued to have approached this consistency. Mouse click enemies, mouse click on your inventory. In the modern action RPG though, battle and battle prep are speaking two completely different languages and lurching between them while playing is like stopping halfway through a tiramisu so you can down a packet of pom bears. The best quote-unquote action RPGs force you into prep as little as possible. I'm thinking Dark Souls or Kingdom Hearts, where you're not constantly being bombarded with new kit to think about. In fact, Kingdom Hearts is unique in that melding menu-based combat into real time is sort of the point and part of the aesthetic. The most annoying examples are games that have you constantly stopping the action to consider what new piece of equipment will slightly elevate your chances. From the best action RPGs to the worst, the issue at the end of the day is that fiddling with stats feels like busy work when the real decider for whether you're gonna beat the next fight or not is gonna come down to how well you've mastered whatever parry or dodge mechanic the real-time combat is predicated on. If one of these games does stat a boss in a way such as that your dexterity alone is proving insufficient, then the leveling system just ends up feeling like an arbitrary roadblock forcing you to go grind. That's why I roll my eyes, smug git that I am, when people try to suggest action and action RPG are two separate genres. It's like one is a game where you have to learn a combat system where quick reflexes and timing and combos are key, and the other is one where you do the same thing except there's a bunch of tacked on bullshit to do on top of that, barely adding anything worthwhile. If our goal is simply to make a game less abstract, obviously real-time combat is less abstract than turn-based, but then why have we stopped there? Why does character management and inventory remain as abstract as it was 30 years ago? Why aren't we also managing a real-time inventory system where we attach accessories manually belt by belt? If the aim is to up realism, the fear with something like Final Fantasy XVI, a new entry in an RPG franchise going all in on real-time action combat, with combos, dodges, parries, etc., is that it would become one of these stop-and-start action RPG games, where you're constantly stopping to micromanage a bunch of stuff. But in a wild move, they just decided to make an action game with hardly any traditionally RPG-coded mechanics at all. They wanted to make a crazy action game and they committed to that genre rather than trying to bridge the gap between the two genres. And in a way, it's what I respect the game for the most. That it implemented action combat and then just decided to cut out all the stuff that doesn't complement it even if that deleted stuff is associated with the RPG genre. I mean, yeah, there's nods to that RPG type stuff with the most basic weapon upgrade and accessory systems imaginable. But beyond that, there's no elemental weaknesses on enemies, no party management, no elaborate meta upgrade system that has you managing a complex series of modifiers throughout a party, that a card game on the side somehow plays a role in by letting you farm more power. You win fights and you get XP points that you dump into new moves, and then off you go to the next fight. The most RPG thing about it is that every so often you'll fight enough to level up and get objectively stronger. Though this level up screen I feel like is trying to look more complex than it actually is. Your attack, defense, and stagger power goes up, I get that, but what is strength, vitality, and will? Oh, it's just attack, defense, and stagger again, under a different name. What is the point of these? What do they do? Square just said, ah, oh, whatever. We've been wanting to create insane sword fights based around air juggles in this franchise for decades, so we just decided to make that game, deal with it. But, of course, there's problems with doing that in Final Fantasy. It impacts the story and the type of message this game wants to convey in 
negative ways. Final Fantasy stories that deal with grand themes about humanity's role in the universe, like this one, are usually complemented well by gameplay revolving around a team of people, and here not so much by gameplay about one really cool guy who is the strongest, coolest guy. If this was the direction the gameplay was gonna go, maybe a more individualist story would have been a better fit than one that has the usual Final Fantasy focus on the value of teamwork and musings on humanity's overall purpose as a unit. But more on that later, in the story section, if you stick around. Also, this kind of combat is a problem in a game that wants to be as long as a typical Final Fantasy. Last time, seven years ago, in 15, they tried to go for a middle ground between RPG and action, and the result felt like an action game made by aliens. Sure, there was some stop and starting and menu faffing, but the most indecisive element of the combat was how it went for this very weird system, where rather than tap a button for each strike or block, you could hold the button. You could just hold the button and then the character would just continuously do that type of move. Sometimes it made more sense to tap, sometimes to hold, but whenever you were holding, you felt much less in control of your character. You weren't in control of their every move, but more so deciding what type of general things they should be doing. However, there was some logic behind this system. At the time, I remember an interview with the director of 15 received some backlash where he implied frantically mashing buttons would be tiring. But you gotta keep in mind, he's directing a Final Fantasy game. Sure, having to repeatedly hit buttons isn't a big deal in a 12-hour action game where bosses are made to be a few minutes long. But in Final Fantasy, bosses can take like 20 minutes, and the game itself take over 50 hours. And yeah, I can confirm that after playing this game for over 70, mashing buttons, my thumb did get ruined. Towards the end, I couldn't even grip any weights for a day or two. I even sacrificed gains here for the realm, if you can believe it. It's just one of the many issues that come with making an action game this long. In a 12-hour action game, you're usually picking up new skills or abilities every 20 minutes or so. Almost every battle comes with the opportunity to try something new, but when you stretch things out like FF16, you can go for hours without unlocking anything new for the combat. Longer still if you choose to do optional content, where your XP payouts aren't going to be as big. One of the most fun periods of the game for me was actually early on, when you're unlocking a lot of cheap basic moves back to back, and the dynamics of combat are changing quickly and often. With this long length, music has to be repeated for a lot of major encounters and bosses, and the enemy pool starts getting repetitive. Turn-based RPGs were just as guilty in many ways of getting repetitive in their length, but it was a much simpler and easier task for the developers to mix things up. There you could create a whole new fight that made the player think differently just by adjusting certain stats. To create an enemy with original weaknesses and strengths and force different strategies out of the player. If you want to mix up the gameplay in a real-time combat system, you have to create whole new enemies with new animations and implement their hitboxes. There's only so much that can be done across such a long game. Instead, reskinned enemies that do stronger damage are usually the go-to here. Asking the player to simply get more consistent at dodging attacks they've already seen before. By becoming an action game, there's also stuff I would probably let slide in a traditional Final Fantasy that no longer slides here. Gimmicky little quick time like button minigames have been in the series before to justify some moves with extra spectacle, and they have those here. Before though, they served the opposite purpose they end up serving now. Back then it was to test the player's reaction skills more than the core gameplay did, to reward them with a powerful move. Now that we're dealing with real-time, reaction-based combat, they do the opposite. They take away control to show a powerful move, which doesn't feel that rewarding. Like you're being told, this is, this is just too epic to give you total control. But anyway, how is the core combat? Well, pretty good, and even great in areas. Though it may fall into some pitfalls, it can legitimately rock at times. The protagonist Clive is packing the usual checklist action game moves here, albeit with the production value of a mainline Final Fantasy, making every move just feel that little bit better or look that bit more impressive. You have your parry, your perfect dodge, your combo mix-ups. You get a few limited jump cancels and eventually you can expand your moveset to grabs and perfect blocks with over-the-top counters. To have the jump cancel be a little more limited, only letting you do about three of them before having to return to the ground, actually forces the player to get more creative to keep things up in the air. 
which makes for at least a change of pace from DMC. The thing you want to do the second you start this game is switch over to a control scheme where charging magic is on the L1 button. You may think enemies are reacting in fear to you for story reasons, but it's actually because they just saw you switch over to having magic on L1. This means you can keep your magic charging almost all the time, which other than helping deal more damage, can launch enemies into the air. There's no easy dedicated launch move. To launch, there's always a significant bit of wind-up involved, so finding creative ways to get enemies up is fun. The interesting thing with the magic charge, though, is that it's in fact stronger than the magic shot post-perfect dodge, which was odd that I can quickly charge up a more powerful shot than the one I get by risking a last second evasion. That is until you unlock the buff perfect dodge, which will make any attacks done after a dodge more powerful for a bit, including the charge shot, which made the original counter dodge instantly obsolete. And I don't know if that was the intention. Now I can just hold L1 to charge magic, and every time I perfect dodge, I now have a super cannon. When I first saw this special dodge in previews, I got worried that it was gonna get super old watching your guy skid away from attacks with this same camera angle. But it turns out, it didn't really. I think what's cool about dodging like this is that sometimes there's so much shit going on on screen that you don't even get to see the dodge until your character skids out of all the chaos unscathed. It can be pretty badass. Like many games with generous timed dodges that make you invincible or give you free hits, it does end up overshadowing a lot of other mechanics though, becoming a crutch when the chips are down due to how powerful they are, giving you all these invincibility frames while buffing your moves. Games like Ninja Gaiden and DMC5 and even Kingdom Hearts don't suffer from this, but don't be surprised if when the chips are down in FF16 you end up defaulting to dodging like this as much as possible. It makes it hard for me to even remember a lot of fights in the game, because when bosses would start pulling out their best, most creative moves, my response would end up being fairly similar in all of them. Let's get perfect dodging. And after the fight, I'd forget what moves they even did. One of my favorite moves in the game is the electric crystal thing that you can place on the ground that does major stun damage to any enemy that hits it. Setting things up just right to lure enemies in is a whole lot of fun. And the game gives you ample ways to attract foes, such as the whistle move. The ice moves you get here are super cool, like the freeze dodge, that can keep enemies suspended. There's your wolf, who you can work into combos, kind of like Shadow in DMC5, except if you were still playing as Dante. You could even send him in after certain attacks for a critical hit, if you time his commands well, tempting you to maximize damage dealt as much as possible. Production value again helps to make fights exciting. The world of FF16 is depicted as this dark, hopeless place where fighting back at first seems fruitless. Yet if you decide to fight, you're treated to the most inspiring music ever with instruments currently on fire that spur you on to shine bright in this pitch black world. <laughs> you unlock the ability to extend combos by canceling out of them. There are so many cool moves that even if doled out slowly will still net you with an amazing tool set for creative play and expression by the end. There's one big problem though. Uh-oh. Cooldown timers, the combat equivalent of repeatedly turning your pillow over to the cold side. Like with almost anything with cooldown timers, there is a hypothetical version of this game where all hell breaks loose, where you have every move available to you to switch between at once. But alas, it's not to be. Cooldown timers mean certain moves cannot be activated again until certain time passes. No amount of skill in combat will get you that move again any quicker, like it at least does with the Limit Break Devil Trigger that you can fight more to regain. Cooldown timers mean you're rewarded with great power for waiting, which isn't very exciting. Since these moves can't be spammed, they get to be very powerful, but in turn that means you can only have six available in combat at one time, even though there's about 30 of them. And for almost every move here, I could see a way to get them into the game without the use of cooldown timers. With some, it would just be a question of making them do less damage while keeping whatever effects they have on the enemy. With others, maybe they could have implemented a longer wind-up. With the really powerful ones, like the Super Beam, why not have it, again, have a longer wind-up, and let it leave you vulnerable, not invincible, while you shoot it? Meaning you'd have to read the environment a little and find a good place and time to do it, 
rather than just thoughtlessly hitting it when it's available. There is of course a bit of strategy to all of this. Enemies will be dealt more damage when staggered, and some cooldown moves are better at staggering and others at dealing damage. So you want to save them for when their respective jobs are most appropriate. But that's not enough for me. One ability you unlock later is just an entirely new weapon, which is cool, but equipping it by that point means giving up something else, like a dodge or block move, and that might make you hesitant to experiment. The switch target button also just has a mind of its own. If there's more than two enemies, it's almost like it's trying to go off and attach itself to the least useful target possible. Sometimes rather than trying to cycle through, it just takes less time to unlock and just go hug the guy you want to be aiming at. Another mode of combat is the big monster fights in this game, where you take control of the summon Ifrit and throw down with the others. They're more simple than the regular combat, but transfer just enough of your abilities from regular play over to still feel like a test of your basic skills. Uh, when it's not just quick time events. Apparently Platinum Games were involved in this game, and I'm gonna guess that might have been for segments like these. But that's actually a little bit confusing at the moment, given how much better these feel to play than the Bayonetta 3 giant battles, which were much more sluggish and tedious. No matter how well or badly the story is justifying them, or how much actual gameplay you end up doing while they're happening, these giant fights are almost always well directed and paced at least. What else do you do outside of fighting in this game? Well, get ready. You talk to people. It's really kind of crazy how long and big this game is, and yet how you do basically one thing the whole game. Main quest to go fight something, side quest to go fight something. It's weird how there are 12 hour action games that feel more varied. Even DMC5, which sells itself as a game just about fighting things, feels more varied than FF16, because well, one, there's three playable characters who all feel substantially different, but even then the levels still occasionally throw in like some platforming, maybe a real basic puzzle. Here there's nothing but fighting as this one guy until you hit a giant monster set piece, and it makes what is supposed to be a vibrant fantasy world you're exploring feel lifeless. You go to a side quest and you get reams of dialogue justifying how you need to help someone, and at the end of the day you know it's just going to amount to a fight with some monsters somewhere at some point. Like the ins and outs of everyone's situation and problems don't really matter, because what will be expected of you to do will be the same every time. Sometimes you'll be asked to take something somewhere, like this super early quest where you're asked to bring some dinner to some guys, or take some wood across this hideout, and it goes back to that question of, if the combat has been made less abstract, why is stuff like this the most abstract conceptualization of an activity ever? where you press X on the character you want to give a plate of food to. Where's like the physics minigame where you have to balance the plates over to the customers, or balance the wood across the hideout? This stuff is optional, let's just get crazy with it. Where's the side quest where we play this world's elaborate board game everyone is crazy about? Where's the side quest where we get drunk with the lads and have to go on a hunt and all our abilities are on the wrong buttons? Chocobos can be used to get across a level faster, but where are the Chocobo races? It makes you wonder what anybody does in this world in their free time except go to the brothel. Where's the sport? The games? Where are the little cheeky side activities I can do to immerse myself in this world's culture? Like going to the bathhouse or playing the loot for the crowd? I mean, maybe they thought if they put too many goofy side quests in the game that would distract people from the drama of the main story, and then they might feel forced to put a lobster on the box of the next game or something. Understandable concern. Kingdom Hearts has always been pretty good at this sort of thing. It could have very simplistic levels, but just by throwing in some kind of unique activity into them, it could give a location added texture and charm. I feel almost bad because clearly so much effort has been put into recording insane amounts of dialogue, not just when talking talking to quest givers, but through the world, NPCs will be constantly updated and discuss current events. But no amount of flavor text can make up for the immersion these locations lose, with such a lack of things to do besides being hired to talk and then fight monsters. The game can't even trust you to do a navigation challenge on your own. This side quest asks you to take some stuff to various rooms, and then big markers appear to tell you where these rooms are, as if I couldn't figure it out on my own. This side quest asks you to find a buried treasure, and you're given this clue to look for a specific tree, and oh never mind, there's a marker. It's like the game almost wants you to put on a podcast or great video review like this one on in the background while you do this stuff and not think about any of it. Markers are a big annoyance in this game as well. 
A lot of time the game looks beautiful, there are some tremendous environments here, both in detail and scale, and yet when I want a clean look at them I just have all this junk up at the sides. At the time of writing there's no way to turn markers off, and you just wonder why they wouldn't give you the option to see this game's carefully crafted visuals without them unless you open up photo mode to become the other playable character Lakitu. The world of Valisthea, where the game takes place, also suffers from some other problems. First up, when I heard before the game was out that it wasn't going to be open world, I was so happy. Someone decided a AAA fantasy epic does not need to be set in a boring empty wasteland. However, while it's not an open world in the typical sense, it still kind of is one. Just split into four separate chunks, with additional linear levels isolated from them. There's no like running around mining thousands of collectibles, and you can get anywhere pretty quick, so this semi-open world isn't like a problem. The problem is actually how the map contextualizes how big the world of the game is. Because each of the four chunks only takes about 10 minutes to run from one side to the other, which even when combined makes Valisthea seem surprisingly small. When world-ending threats start to creep in and characters talk about humanity being at risk, it sort of rings hollow when their world is about the size of Luxembourg. I also felt really teased by some of the environments you don't actually get to explore. Mostly the populated capitals, which of course if you do go to, need to have been vacated for whatever reason. But if there's one location that really annoyed me for being inaccessible, it's this bonkers castle. It looks like it would have been such a cool location for a throwdown, this regal terrace where humanity tempts fate by trying its hardest to touch God from the highest perch possible. Rays of light shining down on top of a layer of violence. But no, it's just in cutscenes. Yes, one of my complaints is that I don't get to go to a cool castle, just its basement. But this is a fantasy epic, what do you want from me? The game should be about going to cool castles, right? God, side characters don't half drone on in this game. Getting to the point about as fast as a Switch loading screen. It's funny because obviously the side quests here give you more background on the characters of the game and the world they inhabit, and you'd think that would be a serious upgrade compared to the likes of, say, Final Fantasy XIII, where the side quests are blocks of text given to you by a statue. But ironically, even though that game had the same problem of feeling like it could have done with more than just combat. I remember FF13 as having this consistent, wildly high production value, while my memories of FF16 already have the insane spectacle and detail present in much of the main story, overshadowed by the tens of hours I spent doing mannequin-led side quests. And I mean, this sort of quest shows up in the main story too, let's not forget. There's no escape. Obviously this game can look pretty insane at times, but it's of course not a consistent look the game can maintain for its 70 hours of content. My advice to you would be if you play this game, just stick to the main stuff. Don't do what I did and play every side quest as it becomes available. Do the ones with a plus icon that guarantees some sort of upgrade, and you'll probably get a more consistent experience. Go back to the other side quests later if you're desperate for more. Again, there's some awesome music, the main battle theme is really exciting, as well as the way it's remixed throughout the title to match the intensity of what's going on. I'm not sure if it's going to remain in my memory as much as some of the real classic FF themes have, but what you get is already more memorable than what you'll hear in most games. I will say now, today though, that the ambient music didn't hit me as hard as it usually does in a Final Fantasy. I can't really recall any of it off by heart, but the Midgar or Besaid theme? That shit's stuck in my head forever. Anyway, now I'm gonna talk about the story of this game, which is very long, and we're just gonna go through the whole thing. I'm gonna go mostly chronologically, so if you wanna dip out to play, then feel free to do so at any point during my analysis. If you want concluding thoughts, you can skip to here. And with that out of the way, FF16 takes place on Valisthea, a land made out of two continents where every generation someone gets born with the ability to channel one of seven gods, called Icons, or as the gamers know them, the summons from Final Fantasy III, plus Phoenix. The select few able to become these beasts are known as Dominants, and generally end up in quite significant positions in the kingdoms they're born into. Other people can use magic with crystals mined from one of the five giant mother crystals located across the land, each of which is under the control of some faction. But some people are born with the ability to wield magic without crystals, 
They're called bearers and are basically treated as a slave class, branded and forced to toil away for the non-magic people. So why are dominants praised and bearers oppressed, even though they're both born with magic powers? Well, I think you answered your own question, because it's a hypocritical, bigoted society. You know, like, dominants ain't bearers, they're like more than bearers, you know? Also, dominants, I guess, can kill us real easy. Anyway, you play as Clive Rossfield, who is the prince of Rosalia. The Rossfield line typically gives birth to what is thought to be the only dominant of fire, the phoenix. But this generation, it skips Clive, and instead takes to his younger brother, Joshua, who can become the giant firebird, Phoenix. I'm trying to remember if this whole opening was good or not, but look, I'm gonna be honest, it feels like a long time ago now. What you need to know is the King of Rosalia gets betrayed by his wife so she can become queen of the Sandbrek Empire, which annexes Rosalia. The king gets taken out, and Clive sees what he thinks is a second dominant of fire show up and kill Joshua. The twist here is so obvious, I thought they might do something different, uh, but they don't. This this takes the form of a giant fight underground, where you play as Joshua as the Phoenix, trying to fend off this second fire dominant guy. The music here is pretty epic, as we play Azura's Wrath, which is an exact sentence that could be said at many points in this game. Rather than kill Clive, his traitor mum, who didn't like him much anyway, has the Empire take him away and branded as a slave, and thus he is forced into servitude as a soldier for 13 years, carrying out dirty work for the Empire. This is a part of the plot I struggled with a bit. I mean, Clive has Phoenix powers passed on to him by his brother, so he does make a pretty good soldier slash assassin. But when annexing a country, you'd think disposing of its heirs would be number one on the to-do list. What's keeping him from coming back years later looking for revenge? Well, he'll be killed if he deserts the Empire. All right, sure. But you know, this guy has nothing left to lose, really. So at least just, you know, maybe don't put him in any rooms with high-ranking Empire officials or anything. 13 years later and Clive does decide to desert when one of the targets he's sent out to eliminate turns out to be his childhood friend, Jill. This is too much for Clive and he turns on his teammates, saves his friend and teams up with Sid who conveniently shows up. Sid is the dominant of Ramu, an electric wizard guy, and is the leader of a band of outlaws who are attempting to free bearers from their oppressors. Sid wants Clive to join his team, but Clive is hell-bent on finding the second dominant of fire. All I want to do is help. Dominants like her, branded like you. Of course, the realm doesn't approve, which is why we live in a cave. And it's also why we need help from branded who know one end of a sword from the other. What say you, Clive? Until my brother is avenged, I must walk my own path. So Sid decides to help Clive out doing that, in the hopes he'll want to join up somewhere along the way. I think the story starts out kind of rough. It's carried by some great music and visuals, but there's a lot of conveniences and characters making questionable choices. I'm surprised that in 13 years Clive didn't decide to jump ship earlier. But I think more problematically, we don't get to see a second of the worst years of this man's life under the Empire's control. Which, as the guy we embody, feels weird. Like, we just have to imagine some of the stuff that probably weighs on him the most. Plus, I don't really know if I buy the character of Clive Rossfield, enslaved killer, man with everything torn from him, sensitive nice guy. I'll bear that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Even at the peak of his resentment, he just can't help but be, you know, fairly polite to everyone. You know, Cloud and Lightning seemed a lot more resentful and bitter, with not even half the tragedy behind them. And they had phones. Oh, maybe that had something to do with it. I get the balance they're trying to strike. Clive initially is fairly selfish. He has his own thing he wants to do. But he's also pretty nice to everybody, and they're trying to show that he has been made less selfless. But that he's also still the nice kid from the prologue. I think they could have pushed his bitterness harder, though, in these early hours, before he of course comes around to Sid's cause. Maybe they don't show any of the decade-plus Clive enslavement to make his more mild-mannered demeanor when freed more believable. Something that is also weird to me is how Clive's desire for revenge seems to end at finding his brother's killer. He doesn't seem all that interested in getting back at the Sandbrek Empire for killing his father, annexing his country, and making him a slave. I get that, like, as world-ending threats seep into the plot, you would want him to overcome an urge like that in favor of helping humanity, but it's odd to me that hatred towards the Empire 
is just something he doesn't really carry at all, and so never has a need to overcome. The only things that piss him off about them are the crimes they're currently doing, as if they don't have much of a history. Makes you wonder how invested he really was back then in being a prince to his nation. Then there's Sid. Why? He's a pretty likable, charismatic character, which he needs to be as this major leader. The dialogue in this game is written fairly naturally, though the way it comes out is a bit formal and stilted. Everyone kind of waiting their turn to talk. We wait until tomorrow. But he's right there. Maybe I'm talking a little out of my behind here, but I feel like this especially tends to be an issue with a lot of Square Enix games I play. Though I do remember people overlapping from time to time, in 15 at least. What happened to Jerry? There was nothing we could do! In 16, I guess we can pretend people are waiting to respond so patiently, because this is an old-timey setting, and everyone's a bit proper and shit, I suppose. And I'm talking about the actually produced cutscenes, of course. No amount of headcanon is gonna make the side quest shot reverse shot conversations with their small pool of reused animations seem any less uncanny. And again, it's unfortunate the side quests aren't actually where these remain contained to. We also have Jill, Clive's old friend, who also happens to be the dominant of Shiva now, the Ice Queen. Um, she has the opposite problem Clive has, where she acts totally believable as this quiet, almost traumatized woman forced to be a weapon of war to a clan of magic-hating religious zealots. But because of that, she's just a little too reserved and boring. I see. I don't know if we're still going to be talking about her like Tifa and Eris 20 years from now. Anyway, whilst the gang work on helping those in need, there are political squabbles going on in the background. The game has this great feature where you can just hold a button at any time to get some law info on the current situation. Which is really useful at the start when you have no idea who anyone is. I'm glad it's here, though there's no getting around that this is a crutch, letting us pause any scene to research the in-game wiki. It's better than having characters awkwardly exposit who they are and what everything is, but I am left wondering if there could have been a way to get across all the information more naturally. One of FF7's best qualities is its amazing opening, where within five minutes, what's going on is established, you know who everyone is, and you're thrown straight into the action. But after that game, Square immediately said, we are never doing that again. Yes, yeah, scenes like this bring to mind Game of Thrones, a dark fantasy world with political bickering. And honestly, you'd think a great genre for this type of story would be a party RPG, where you play as multiple characters from different regions who have to come together and put aside their cultural differences to unite under a common ideal, instead of a game where you play as one badass. A lot of the political talk in this game is undermined, when you know it's all going to come crashing down by me running in and performing a sick air combo. But that could also be viewed as an appealing feature of the game, I suppose. Like, what if Dante was in Game of Thrones and just plowed through everybody? The first character you plow through is Benedicta Harmon, a high-ranking somebody from the Kingdom of Walud, who is also after the second Dominant of Fire. She's a real piece of work, so it was hard to feel sorry for her when she gets triple owned by us and the game tells us her sad backstory. Uh, she's the dominant of Garuda, a wind woman, and Clive discovers he can absorb other dominant powers when he takes her wind stuff from her. One ability she grants is the grab ability, and yeah, you know, when I got this, I was like, okay, okay, we're gaming now. The fight against her Garuda form is both visually impressive and a lot of fun. Jump cancelling on her, really having to test your skills for the first time here, with an enemy that can do a number on you. It probably won't surprise you that I enjoy the fights where you're human, fighting some big thing, and less the more spectacle-heavy, simple, big monster fights. Again, playing as Ifrit isn't bad, it's just not as involving as having the entire Clive moveset on hand. Speaking of which, Clive becomes Ifrit, a big fire monster, and the two beasts duke it out. Yes, Clive was the second dominant of fire without knowing. His first transformation caused a fit of madness, and he went on to hurt a lot of people, seemingly killed his brother, and then forgot all about it. The second dominant of fire Clive was chasing with Sid, was actually Joshua, who had survived Clive's rampage 13 years ago. It's not a big shocker. All these revelations culminate with a fight inside Clive's mind, where he resolves to accept what happened and push onward with Ifrit's powers, this time by his side. He'll bring that out-of-control power that did so much damage under his control and balance the scales by using it for good. He fights himself, he fights Ifrit, he fights Ifrit as Ifrit. Clive coming to terms with all of this and becoming stronger 
is all well and good, but it does leave him with not very much internal conflicts to deal with from here on, and we aren't that far into the game. It won't be long now before he gets the objective that he will stick to until basically the end. I also think the moment where he comes to terms with what happened could have been more effective if, like I said, he had come off more detached and bitter than he does up till now, and this had been the real turning point. Throughout this first chunk of the game, you can do side quests that mostly revolve around the mistreatment of bearers. You get to see how heinously they're treated. They're basically worked to death because the more they use their magic for their masters, the more they turn to stone. You enter this field and really ominous music kicks in. You're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> And well, it's because you, gamer, have just entered the field of bigotry. Big tree, as it's known. They're on some other shit here. Uh, this guy tricks bearers into fighting wolves. This little girl treats the bearer she owns like a pet until she's consumed by the stone curse. This is really twisted, but was kind of undercut for me when I found the body before the quest, just exploring, and Clive had no reaction. Kind of weird that that's possible. The reaction Clive has to these early quests feels a bit weak. In one, you're tasked with sneaking some bearers some extra food. This one poor girl is being worked to stone at this blacksmith, she's clearly being mistreated, and the best we do is give her a plate of grub and leave. Like, where's the part of the quest where we sneak up on this blacksmith at night undercover and threaten to stab him silly unless he starts treating her better? You know, so she doesn't have to wait for the years-long work of ending slavery we have ahead of us? At least in the wolves one, you can stand up for yourself and they get their comeuppance another way. We'll give them that. There's this implication that Rosaria's treatment of bearers was better than the other kingdoms, which uh, seems a bit of a stretch. Bearers may have been looked down on back in Archduke Elwyn's day, but they were still human beings. Like, I mean, there's being a discriminated slave class and then there's being a discriminated slave class, man. Your father took pity on the bearer's plight. Yeah, can we get a source on that one? Well, turns out we do get a source later on and the King of Rosaria did want to free the bearers. And it's made clear that back in the day, Jill and Clive were too young to really fully comprehend their plight. But I don't know, I still think Rosaria's getting a little too much credit here. And yet, even acknowledging that, I was weirdly touched by the quest where Clive must play the part of his father to a senile old man who fondly remembers working for the kind king in his kitchen. In your grace, I prayed to the founder that you would come, and at long last, he answered. Will we be returning to the castle then? There is still a place for me in the kitchens? No, my friend. We will not be returning to the castle, not yet. I'm on a very important expedition. Yeah, I get it. This guy probably didn't have much in the way of workers' rights down there while he was making the soup. But this quest still got me a little choked up. You know, loyalty is still an endearing trait, and it's telling they force you to do this quest, even though it only has side quest level polish. After a bearer sympathizing town is burned to the ground, Clive decides to put aside his quest for revenge and officially join Sid's cause which we can't give him uh, too much credit for since he found out his quest for revenge was against himself. You see, there's another threat looming on the horizon, the Blight. A black corruption eating away at the land and making it unlivable. Sid reasons that just as the stone curse corrupts those who can use magic, the giant magic crystals dotted around the world that people mine for magic power are doing the same to the planet. So the two set out to destroy them, and with all this talk of powerful people exploiting land... If the powers that be know all of this, why do they sit idle and allow it to continue? In case you haven't noticed, the God-fearing people of this realm and their pious leaders care for but one thing, themselves and characters voicing doubts about whether it's the right thing to do to tear these things down when in the short term, a lot of people will be hurt. If this all works and the blessing fades, things are likely to get worse for our kind before they get better. Being the last to wield ether will make our talents that much more sought after. By which I mean, hunted. You know, the collapse of the economy, the further exploitation of bearers. But what of all the people you mean to rob of their comfort? Are you happy for them to call you outlaw? You think maybe the game is going to start tackling environmental conflicts and themes, but other than the fact you're going to be destroying these polluting crystals, it's not really explored or discussed that much. Very little is done with this concept, aside from the giant crystals being huge objective markers we're going to go to. 
Sid sets up this crystal destroying mission, there's a moment of doubt, and then the rest of the game is them doing it. I just hope in the end, they'll see that we didn't have any other choice. That it was the only way to get us to a better place. And here I was thinking I was the uncertain one. Luckily, two out of three of us have faith in you. It's just a little weird to set this up as the major impending threat and driving motivation for the main cast, and then not really exploit it at all for drama beyond the corridors of enemies you have to destroy to get to the crystals. What if some well-meaning people, whose lives depend on the use of the magic crystals, stood between Clive and a mother crystal, putting him at odds with the sort of folks he ideally wants to recruit for his band of merry men, trying to end the oppression of bearers, forcing him to mediate with them or just carry some guilt as he presses on. Why are there barely any levels set in blight-infested lands to show us what we're fighting for and what has already been lost? The point is, it's hard to play FF7 and not get swept up in the emotion, the melancholy of this world on the precipice of death, the way the world of that game was drawn and presented to the player. While here, this side of the story comes off a bit clinical and detached and business-like. It's like they wrote in the Mother Crystal polluting stuff and then someone ran into the room shouting, Oh, we can't go through all this again. We did it 25 years ago. Did they not get the point after a whole game of this? What do you want us to do? Redo that old game? Oh, you do. Anyway, the gang successfully destroy the Empire of Sandbrek's crystal. Somewhat conveniently, if you destroy a small crystal inside the bigger crystal, that destroys the whole crystal. Clive has to fight Typhon, or some other thing in the Japanese version of the game. According to the wiki, he's not called Typhon in Japan. Well, that's unnerving. How do I know this thing is Ifrit and he's not called Dave or something? There are casualties, though. Sid incurs too many injuries and passes away. It's a bit confusing how. He attacks Typhon, and when Clive returns from the boss fight dimension, he is dying. Perhaps he overexerted himself. It was implied already that he had been using his magic too much. It's tragic, and he was a pretty fun character, so it's sad to see him go. In his last moment, he saves Clive from this creepy guy called Ultima, who Joshua, who had been revealed to be alive, has to show up and contain inside him. This will all be on the test later. Uh, Ultima is also uh, the main villain of the game, and he has an evil plan. Okay. While away, Sid's hideout is ransacked by Hugo Kupka, the dominant of Titan and big political player in the Dalmechian Republic, a kingdom located in a southern desert. It's revenge for the death of Benedicta, his lover. We jump ahead five years and Clive has taken on the name Sid and is in charge of his old gang who have moved to a new hideout. So with all this said, let me jump ahead for a second. Later in the game, there are these long chains of side quests that deal with conflicts between opposing groups of people that end in pretty sugary sweet ways. Kind of unbelievable ways where people change their entire life perspective in a day. But the big issue is it's not really Clive who does the convincing. Oh, he shows up in the quests to kill some monsters to further things along and make sure everybody is alive to make up. But he's not really the driving force in that making up part. The point is, he's not really the driving instigator of change, and unfortunately, that sort of extends to the main plot too. Clive is kind of lucky he shows up and Sid already has this whole operation underway, that he can just drive to its conclusion by being the strongest guy. I think an interesting way to have done things would have been to not have Sid's operation exist when Clive breaks free of the Empire. Maybe he meets Sid during captivity, or shortly after, and while Sid has these big dreams of saving bearers and destroying mother crystals, Clive is too bitter and dejected to care and just wants revenge. On Joshua's killer, and maybe on the whole Sandbreck Empire, in my fanfic version, then Clive could come around when Sid dies, maybe at the hands of a real shitter of a bigot crystal polluter, and he decides to continue Sid's dream of helping the world, clawing together an operation by the skin of his teeth to save the people. Now that would be an epic journey. Instead, five years after Sid's death, while the kingdoms are distracted fighting, Clive is like, okay, team that Sid put together, let's go demolish these big crystals. I don't know, it just feels like you could replace Clive with Donkey Kong, whose Sid's team just point and launch or whatever needs sorting, and not a whole lot would change about the story. This first mission as Sid the Clive has you meeting up with old friends in his annexed homeland of Rosaria, including his trade baron uncle, who is a pretty funny guy. I don't have much to say about him, he's just got a really fun energy. 
had me cracking up. Like real Zelda CDI King energy. Uh. Which is always appreciated in this sort of setting. This is kind of the point though where you start realizing that this dark fantasy game isn't all that dark. Clive basically just runs into people who instantly befriend him and everything's good. And I think the game feeling like such a happy-go-lucky trip down Friendship Street is because we skipped overseeing the decade and a half of misery our protagonist went through. To him, all this is a light at the end of a long tunnel, but to us it's like most of the game. The fact everyone is so quick to befriend Clive and him to befriend them kind of undermines how at the end this is supposed to be a triumphant story about people coming together. That part doesn't take much effort. Anyway, it's off to the next big crystal, and this one is under the control of the Ironblood, who are the most consistent bigots in the realm in that they also oppress dominance. They force Jill to be their dominant in war by threatening the lives of innocents, and now it's time for her to get her revenge. But never mind that. Did you notice nobody uses the bow and arrow? in this old fantasy world? Like seriously, nobody. And that makes some sense. They have magic crystals that can shoot energy balls. We can kind of give them a pass. But if that's the reason though, you'd think the Ironblood who see using magic as an abomination and disrespectful to the giant crystal they worship, wouldn't they be the bow and arrow masters? I guess they don't consider ranged combat that important. Anyway, this level is especially striking from the way in. And that's all I really have to say about that. It's a volcano level. You fight a blobby fire monster, you destroy the crystal, and Jill gets her revenge on her once captors, which is like good for her. But the fact that she gets release so early into the game does mean it feels like she doesn't have much to do after this. Now I can continue at your side with my head held high. At this point, you're just kind of waiting for her to hand over the ice power. It's also odd to me that Clive's plotline hints more towards the futility of revenge, while Jill's just kind of accepts that's what she needs to do to move on. But it doesn't feel deliberate. It feels more like they just wanted to get her stuff out of the way. Hugo Kupka sets up a trap to catch Clive, revenge for killing Benedicta. So the team head to Rosaria, fall into a trap, get bailed out by Gav. And it's still funny to me there's a character in this game called Gav. I don't think I need to say much about him, really. His name says everything you'd ever need to know. Oh, fuckers. Clive and Hugo really hate each other, and unfortunately at this point I had forgotten that, oh yeah, Hugo destroyed the original hideout, getting a lot of people killed. So that's why Clive is extra mad. The problem is, pretty much every major character that we meet in the original hideaway survives into the second one. The player doesn't feel a great repercussion from this event because we barely got to meet the people who were lost. All that tangibly changes for the player is we get to upgrade from a cave to a cruise ship as our base of operations. Hugo and Clive 1v1 in the basement of Clive's old home, and while Clive doesn't kill him, he does take his power and cut off his hands. Hugo is saved by the Lord Commander of the Walud Army. I'll just call them the Scandies from now on, because they have an accent and their dominant is Odin. Soon all will know. I think Kupka. Uh, is a pretty neat character. He has this very proper, intellectual way of talking when he's doing politics. There is a literal sea twixt you and your prize. The armies of Sambrek need but sit back and watch as you harmlessly lap against their walls. But it's all just this big mask for the raging monster down underneath that the player gets to see get the better of him as we take him on. Anyway, to finish him off, the team are gonna have to infiltrate his homeland of Dalmechia. It's one of the coolest looking areas in the game. It's got these cool hot springs, very realistic rocks. I get, look, I give the compliments out when they're deserved. Yes, you have to do a bunch of busy work there before they let you head over to the crystal and fight Kupka, where the Scandi Knight has encouraged him to use more of the Mother Crystal's power to go beast mode. This bit of busy work feels like some of the worst in the game, because it already feels like we just got denied the rest of the fight with Kupka, and now we have to do a fetch quest for some smirky guy. Once you catch up with him, the two go beast mode, and the first phase of the fight is Ifrit versus Titan in this ground arena. The best part about this fight is that Ifrit can still jump cancel saw like Clive can in his regular form, which is really fun to do because of how ridiculous it looks. Titan absorbs more power from the crystal and grows even bigger. At this point I was thinking, okay, well mission failed, time to regroup and figure out a new plan, and 
Oh, 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 we're just, we're just going for it. Okay. This is probably the best of the mechanically simplified big summon set piece fights, purely because of how unexpected it is. Running at this thing from a mile away builds up a great sense of anticipation. You have no idea how Clive is going to turn the tables on this thing, and the fight keeps you hooked trying to guess. Whereas in the other big monster fights, you pretty much know from the outset it's going to be whoever fires the biggest laser. As cool as that is, of course, this also underlines the problem with these set pieces. In regular fights, the player is the one who has to figure out how to win, choosing moves wisely. While here, the game is deciding how the fight is going to play out and how it's going to be won. How you overcome the boss is going to be some contextual thing that Ifrit is going to decide for you, like grabbing one of these big tentacles. No matter how big the spectacle of these more scripted fights get, that always deflates them for me. Compared to a lot of games, though, they are at least a little more involving with a few more options on the table in the heat of the battle at least. It's not just quick time events in one three hit combo or something. Once Hugo Kupka is taken care of alongside his crystal, only two crystals remain, one of which is in the Dominion, a small independent state the Empire invaded while the team was destroying their crystal five years ago. Some more characters get introduced, like Mid, Sid's daughter. Any road while I'm here. I was hoping you could do us a favor. The moment she shows up, you can almost hear the thud of the mandate hitting the writer's desk to introduce the cute, upbeat girl character into the Final Fantasy game already. Having her appear and send you on a mandatory fetch quest was probably misguided, but she endeared herself to me at least by being one of the most convincingly northern women I've seen portrayed in a video game. Great, here he goes, gosh! The level in the Dominion ends up being one of the most memorable in the game, and ironically, not because you fight Bahamut in space. This is one of the few times you get to run around a big capital city in the game. Here during a civil war, which is, I suppose, an exciting enough reason that the streets are largely empty. Clive's mom shacked up with the Emperor of Sambrek and now has a child she wants to make Emperor. But the Emperor's previous son, Dion, the dominant of Bahamut, is at odds with this, since ever since Clive's mum arrived, his dad has been a real dickhead ruler. For some reason though, Dion as Bahamut starts destroying the city. Turns out Ultima was playing the part of the Emperor's new son, and he casts a spell or something on Dion to make him go on a rampage. Which means Joshua and Clive get to finally reunite by fusing together into one big monster and do quick time events. Which is what I do when I meet up with someone after a long time too. The two put a stop to Bahamut who manages to eliminate his puppet brother, and this loss combined with seeing the son she thought dead alive again drives Clive's Pratt mom insane. She's obsessed with bloodlines and creating the perfect child, who could wield the most power, and saw Clive as a failure because he didn't have superpowers immediately. Always your father's son, so very strong and bold and daring, and yet you failed to awaken. Would that Joshua had been granted a tenth of your strength? How the nobles laughed that Elwyn's firstborn was surely the son of a concubine, and my own, not long for this world. The shame of it. That said, the plot now has to do some complex math to put her out of her misery, because while the two leads are hardly her biggest fans, they still probably aren't going to kill her because she's their mum, but the audience wants blood so she has to go crazy and take herself out. Anyway, one crystal remains now, and it's in Ash, aka Scandinavia. But before that, the free city of Kenvar is attacked, and we have some team members there, so we all head on down to do a bit of fighting. King Scandi, Barnabas, the dominant of Odin, shows up and owns us, and then shortly after he owns us again, and considering about an hour later Clive pulls the power out of his ass he needs to beat him, it does feel a bit like we're dragging things out. Clive and Jill hit up a nudist beach, and Jill feels obligated to give Clive her ice power, which means she will still have powers, but will struggle to control her icon Shiva if she ever transforms again. And thank god she made that sacrifice, because with her powers the game is officially over. Her ice blast can totally demolish an enemy's stagger meter. So use that, then break out Bahamut's laser, and not much is going to stand against you again. Barnabas seems fully on board with whatever Ultima is planning, because he sees him as a god. Probably because he lets Barnabas use him to see any famous person in the country naked. Ultima is some weird creepy magic guy who wanted to grab Clive back at the Empire's crystal to make him a vessel for some master plan, as well as using magic to turn everyone into blue zombies. I won't bother making the comparison we're all thinking of there. Once the team arrive in his territory, the continent of Ash, you realize he's had this plan well underway as the entire country has been wiped out. Almost everyone turned into magically lost zombies. 
and Barnabas is waiting for Clive to arrive so he can mess with him a bit. It's quite shocking to get to Ash and see the state it's in, but it also means they don't have to make any functioning towns here, which I'm sure saved some time. Nevertheless, it's a dark and oppressive final area for the game to draw to its conclusion. Fitting. The Barnabas fight is pretty cool. I like the bit where he transforms and you have to fight Big Odin. But you know, it's a bit cliched how things go down. Oh no, it cannot be. He has used the power of will to make a sword. All right, save it for the ending now, please. You dare! Could it be you've made a weapon of your weakness? It's getting a bit repetitive. It seems that Barnabas, under Ultima's command, is being tasked with testing Clive, so he'll be stronger for Ultima to use later. In Barnabas's mind, he's getting what he wants even if you beat him. So it's a win-win for this far gone guy. It's kind of a shame this character only really amounted to being a pawn for Ultima. You are the key, Mythos. And with this humble offering, shall I prove my faith once more? Since Ultima's plans are nothing but the total elimination of humanity, it's not really like he can do much to justify his beliefs or anything. At best, he's been misled by Ultima and thinks that's not gonna happen. In which case, any justification he makes for his actions end up being meaningless lies he's been fed. But you know, somebody needed to be the second in command sub-final boss. If there was any doubt at this point what Ultima's plans were, uh, he shows up before the final crystal to take you to his PowerPoint dimension, where he uses visual guides to explain his plan. Brilliant. He manages to make what he wants to do sound more confusing than it actually is though. Why does he do this show? Is he expecting to make a really convincing argument for turning everyone into blue zombies and destroying the world as we know it? Did he take Barnabas to the PowerPoint world and he was really convinced so he thought he'd try again with Clive? The plan is that Ultima once belonged to a race of advanced magic users who used up their world by exploiting magic too much. So Ultima discovers Valisthea and wants to forge a new world there, but he's a little weak, so he decides to go into hibernation. Before doing that, he creates humanity, sprinkling his power into the mix, so that one day a powerful magic user will be born that he can use to remake the world. Clive is the culmination of that evolution. Not only can he use magic, not only is he a dominance that can summon Ifrit, but he's the one guy who can absorb the powers of all the dominants to become one big cocktail of magic. How does Ultima create humanity? Why can magic, if passed down through humanity, generation after generation evolve into Clive? Uh, uh, I don't know. I suppose it's just a special magic version of evolution. All of that's probably kept a little too vague, but I can roll with it, I guess. Joshua pieces some of this together earlier when he sees a mural of all the icons coming together under Ultima. Playing, I realized early the icons were all the OG summons from FF3, so I kept wondering when Leviathan would show up since he was the only one not making an appearance for the longest time, and here he gets his one reference. Even Leviathan the Lost is here. Funny, you can't hear the cha-ching noise that reverberated across the studio when this line was recorded, the moment they suddenly had an excuse to do DLC. After a courtesy boss fight, Clive manages to destroy the final Mother Crystal here, but Ultima creates one final super big crystal above the Earth, and heads up there to wait for Clive to come for the final phase of his plan. This is a good time to stock up on stuff and do a round of side quests. By this point, you even get some real cutscenes out of a few of them. Though, uh, though don't expect too much. I did like how this one side quest, where you help this man get over his depression by encouraging him to bake, paid off. By having his buns become such a hit, they start popping up at the hideout. I'll give him that one. My brother said that your order was helping him with his quest to uncover Ultima's origins. Have you learned anything of note since last we spoke? No, this is a side quest. We don't have any cocking info on Ultima. But if you stick with us, you may get to be in a fight and then learn about how we should all stick together. I also think I should probably mention one of my favorite NPCs in the game the hopeless romantic. She'll be stood up here for like the whole game, and after every chapter her dialogue gets updated. Every time she's in love with a new member of the cast, and uh, you know, it's a nice fun touch. Have you seen His Highness the Prince? We were to dine together, or so I was going to suggest, before he vanished, that is. <sighs> I suppose now I'll just have to ask the bard. More entertaining to me than a lot of the sad, please cry with a single tear side quests that are on offer. Team final level is Clive, Joshua, and Dion. I don't really have much to say about Dion. He's a pretty cool dude, a traditional noble prince guy, and that's why everyone in the game ends up liking him. I let him off for being the second in command of a large empire built on the back of slavery. It is weird that Dion and Clive don't have basically any discussion, um, about Clive having served in Dion's slave assassin army. Uh, 
I suppose an apology would have been nice on that one, actually. Ah, uh, well, you know, he didn't seem to be the Empire's biggest fan, even when he was a part of it. And I grew to like him because he doesn't ask you to do any side quests, which makes him a chill guy in my book. I also personally prefer it when we get a gay character like him, who we are told is gay because we just so happen to see him tastefully kissing another guy, and not by him being some kind of walking stereotype who doesn't actually get to have a proper relationship with anyone. Though it is weird that when Dion goes off to the last battle alongside Clive, he doesn't want to say, uh, track down his boyfriends to say goodbye or anything. Damn, maybe they weren't that serious after all. Joshua is another story. The fact I can, like, sum up the plot of the whole game without really mentioning him much says uh, something. If the other characters wrap up their internal conflict in the story early, then Joshua reigns as the absolute champion of that, by doing it at the start of the game off-screen and sort of just staying on task for the rest of it. Just don't forget. You're not alone. Like everyone else, he's performed well and comes across genuine. There just doesn't seem to be a whole lot going on that we get to see with him. Fun dynamics are hinted at between characters, but instead of taking the opportunity to explore those things, maybe in a side quest, every side quest ends up being some dead serious cautionary tale about sticking together, or some melancholic reminiscence of days gone by, maybe to keep things more dark fantasy. But I think it leaves what could potentially have been a really fun cast wanting for material to really endear themselves to the player, beyond tragedy or overly earnest debt repayment. Like they hinted a connection between Joshua and Mid. Where's like the hijinks filled side quest where Clive helps Joshua go on a date with her? And then the ending is like heartwarming because the two brothers got to bond doing something they should have been able to to do growing up, rather than their bonding side quest being a super serious, morose, gravesite visit about continuing the will of their father. The finale begins with Ifrit, Phoenix, and Bahamut fighting Ultima. It's essentially one big cool cutscene, but they chuck in some quick time events to pretend it isn't. Dion nobly sacrifices himself for his two companions, and shortly later Joshua's body gives out. From magic overuse, trying to contain Ultima inside him, you take your pick. And I will say the performance here, coming out of Clive, is one of the best and most believable in the game. Joshua! <laughs> it feels very human and raw. Ultima placed a part of himself within each Mother Crystal. Maybe that played a part in creating the Mother Crystals, or it's a way for him to take the energy the Mother Crystals absorbed from Valisthea. Either way, with them all destroyed and all of its parts free. Ultima is able to activate his real deal ultimate form for the final boss. To preempt everything I'm about to say about this finale, I will say that this three part final boss is very well directed and paced and presented. You get a real juicy finale here that doesn't feel lacking in content. There's a desperate one on one fight to start with, a big monster clash for phase two where you're perfect dodging galaxies, and then a final triumphant 1v1 throwdown to finish things up. All the while the game is cutting to Clive, verbally owning the villain as he gains the upper hand. Epic music roars as these demigods clash. But overall, I wasn't really into it all that much. Every single thing this finale does, I've seen done before. I've seen Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, I've played Azura's Wrath, and I don't know if I need Final Fantasy to become what it is here in this final fight. The message of the game amounts to this. Ultima sees himself as a god. He created humanity, and humanity don't deserve to be part of the new world he's creating, because look what they do with the power he left them. They subjugate each other and do war and cause pain. Do you imagine yourselves worthy of one? Mankind has no place in our world. Is this truly so difficult to comprehend? But just like how the bearers learn to fight back against their oppressors for justice, in turn, humanity as a whole have to fight back against their own would-be master, Ultima. Now you must learn that this master will not tolerate disobedience. Thus proving that humanity working together is a force for good and is worthy of free will. Those who brought into the system of subjugating bearers and the concept of bloodline supremacy. That is why I gave Rosaria to Sambrek, that I might join my line with the Lesages and birth a savior of this benighted land. Are condoning the system that allows them to be manipulated by someone with their hands on even more power, like Ultima. It's nothing groundbreaking, but it's a fine message. As Clive fights back against Ultima, the voice of his friends can be heard cheering him on.
and he makes the point that Ultima could have been stronger had he worked alongside humanity. Ultima says he doesn't need anyone, and Clive says that his friends are what make him strong. And you see, this is largely a point made by a lot of Final Fantasy games. Except in those, they don't really need a guy to say that his friends are his power, or to have them phone in over mind radio if they don't want to. Because in those games, you'll actually be at the final boss with a bunch of people teaming up to fight the boss. It's funny, right? Uh, in something like DMC5, the game also ends on these demigods doing battle. But while Final Fantasy likes to muse on the role of humanity, its place in the world, these grand themes about the nature of existence, DMC5, even though there's usually some threat to humanity in the background, focuses primarily on characters hashing out very personal conflicts. A family squabble, a character questioning where they fit in and who they are. Virgin. And these more personal stakes are reflected in more personal gameplay, where you get to be a single cool dude showing off who they are to the world, expressing who they are as an individual. Something the player can participate in via the rich mechanical depth on offer and the character each move's animation exudes. When Final Fantasy games deal with these lofty concepts involving humanity working together, that's usually expressed in gameplay too, because you'll be fighting some big godlike final boss with a bunch of people by your side, healing each other, buffing each other, taking on the threat together. FF16 suffers from a mismatch, super personal mechanics in a conflict that wants to be about the unified power of humanity, and it just doesn't feel right. You don't even have your wolf here at the final battle. So when the game goes in for its super cheesy final line that tries to name drop the name of the franchise, the only fantasy here is yours. And we shall be its final witness. I wasn't like offended, because it isn't like FF16 is a bad game, but I also didn't think it was entirely justified. Should the name of this franchise be dropped, in a line in a game that I don't think is really representative of what Final Fantasy as a series is uniquely good at doing. There's an issue with how all of this is tonally handled. No part of the game feels like it was worked on more by a separate studio than the rest of the game, than moments like this where Clive does an epic comedy quick time event punch on the main bad guy to finish him off. Before then seeing the game heavily imply his final fate, is tragically passing away after using all that power consumes his body. I like over-the-top action games, but this, a tragically ending Final Fantasy game doing something like this, I was like, ah, not feeling it. I half grinned, half awkwardly grimaced at what I was seeing. The game within a span of 10 minutes trying to be both an earnest tragedy and an irreverent action comedy. Not that that can't be done, I suppose, just feels kind of desperate that one of gaming's most well-known grand fantasy texts, now taking a swing at doing an old, dark fantasy setting, feels the need to become Scott Pilgrim at the end. For what? To cater to Bayonetta fans? I'm a Bayonetta fan, and I don't need every game to try and emulate it. The game comes across as bloated with all of its different characters and factions, when at the end of the day, victory versus the existential threat was won by trying really hard and believing in yourself. Final Fantasy has been guilty of doing this before, FF13 for example was largely about doing that, and it got really confusing at the end how they managed to weasel their way out of the predicament. But I liked how in that game, it still felt like the characters were exploiting some cheeky technicality to get through it. Well here it's just Clive being like a mega badass that won't give up. I also liked how in FF13 most of the main team feel phenomenally underqualified for the seemingly impossible task ahead. While well, here everyone is the most well-trained, qualified, special person ever, all descended from these worshipped bloodlines, which funnily enough runs the risk of validating some of the opinions of the title's villains. Though there is one cool idea we do get out of it. I do find it kind of cool, whether it was fully intentional or accidental, that this game starts with the Sandbreck Empire and the Kingdom of Rosalia in conflict, 
And then at the end here, the princes of both kingdoms are combining forces to save the world. With such a bigger cast in FF16 and so much talking and conversation, I kept waiting after Clive overcame his issues so soon into the game for it to become about something more interesting than just stopping a scary monster guy, and it never quite gets there. While other FF games prodded your intrigue for much longer with harder questions, this game doesn't do the same with its fairly cut and dry anti-bigotry plotline and its stop the world ending monster plot. Anyway, all that waffle about the story to say it's okay. If I were a teenager and this was my first exposure to violent sex and the will of humanity in a game, this would probably be one of my favorite games, but it's a little too late for me. There's a lot of effort here to give Final Fantasy a slightly more realistic texture. This is a more explicit game, and I'm not opposed to them trying that, to create a more relatable world. It all offers the game an added level of human complexity that can intrigue and get you invested. But unfortunately, those hints at complexity don't result in a very interesting story in the end. The overall message of the game, despite the roundabout way we end up getting to it, ends up being a lot simpler. And the characters were a little too dry for me to get caught up in their emotional stakes. The combat is its most solid feature, but that can't support the entire game, especially when there's still imperfections to be found there. I really like that we've gotten a classic, old fantasy, epic adventure with segments of extreme high production value that's not waddling along on some gum and tape engine. It's not something you see every day. Plus one with action combat that takes cues from the best. But the story didn't do a whole lot for me. I'm tired of extravagant set pieces where I have little control, and the combat system isn't unique and compelling enough for me to return to the game just for that. A lot of what's done here is done above average, but not a lot is done that others haven't done better too. It feels like a transitionary title, where next time the kinks in the combat system will get ironed out, There'll be more variety and things to do between main missions, and the story will be more complex and thought-provoking. The problem is, now we have to wait entire console generations between each Final Fantasy game, so iterating like that feels extra painful. When you have to wait seven years for something like FF16, and the game is pretty decent, and not a staggering home run that makes all our dreams come true. You know, back in the day, if you really hated drawing magic, you could just wait a year for the do-over. It's a real shame that it's not a home run, because I would have loved for Final Fantasy to show up once again and provide a beautifully earnest adventure that makes the rest of the industry look try-hard and desperate by comparison. But I think we can agree this wasn't the one to pull that off again. But like I said, there's some teenager out there who's going to be obsessed with this thing, and at least for them it will be this and not some soul-sucking, microtransaction-filled, online, purse-gouging, Skinner Box game. Instead, it will be a single-player epic, but for me, it was focused a little too much on being epic, not focused enough on being a fantasy.